Okay, and they are getting started. Finished with their shuffles, dealing out their eight cards. Once again, this is Damon Stone. And this is Jaffer Batika. And we are watching the final table. The Here we go. Nice. Getting ready to start. We have three stories revealed. Uh, okay. They're going to pick out. which three cards they're going to resource next. This historically means that my hand is very good. It's a tough decision whether or not to I'm mulligan. So I've never actually understood that in the rules. Like, which one of us has to say, I'm mulliganing first? Or do we just awkwardly stare at each other? <laughs> <laughs> Looks like they've both taken mulligans. Did not see satisfactory opening hands, so they're going to take their chances with the, uh, with the uh, next draw. But they have to stick with that next draw, no matter what. So That's correct. <laughs> one As, mulligan, one mulligan only. As always, you know, you, you take the risk of uh, taking a mediocre hand and turning it into a terrible hand. Now, Dave had asked who would choose to mulligan first, and you know, made a joke about staring at each other awkwardly. But the answer, even though he can't hear, is that whoever is been selected as the first player would make the choice whether or not they wanted to mulligan. Like, hey, anyone playing the school people gets to go first, no matter what. <laughs> school people. I think Dave has just renamed the Miskatonic University faction to School People. Go around renaming the rest of them. School people, gun people. Well, I mean, he was calling people. the arcane the book. So, why not? All right, so some pretty thorough shuffling there. The guys are really hoping to draw their, uh, their best possible gun. opening hands. <laughs> I'm keeping this one because this hand is pretty killer. Right, so now they are compelled to keep these hands, but they still have to make the choice out of the out of their starting eight cards, which cards to resource, so. So we see a lot of Miskatonic and a couple of Silver Twilight in Jeremy's hand. He has oh, a single yog soth of card. All He's three probably colors. not going to want to necessarily um, I mean, it's not so resource good. that one. If he does, and he's expecting not to uh, play anytime soon. He's suffering no similar problems because he is just uh, playing mono Miskatonic, which means that basically any card he plays except for the neutral cards are going to be fine for resources. One of those neutral cards is the Ice Shack, which is a very strong card. The ability to destroy a character at will. Great card. Oh, yeah. yeah. That three cost is a little bit of a barrier of entry, but when you can get it to work out, it is a game changer. And again, when he, uh, if he gets that on the table, it will be able to kill any character at will that is skill three or lower. Uh, so Jeremy has opted to go ahead and resource that single Nathaniel Peasley. He doesn't look too scary. Which means that he certainly has others in his deck, and he's probably going to end up using them if it comes in more in the mid game when he'll have a large enough domain to take something of worth. So clearly, uh, Jeremy is looking to uh, have a diversified uh, domain set there. So he's got uh, each color represented. Earlier, are you running Black Dog? We're going to play all of them. Master of Mist. He's got uh, the Claret like Knight ago, there also. Out. That is that neutral card that is sitting on top oh, of his hand right now. Oh, OK. All right. That helps. Which is a great card. It is immune to triggered effects, which means there is very little way of getting rid of that card once it hits the table outside of passives and of course just good old-fashioned losing uh, the combat struggle and only having that left to wound. And Jeremy is figuring out which card he's going to go ahead and resource next. And as the starting player he only gets to draw one card on his uh, opening draw phase so it's a tough decision.
Choices, choices. Because when you resource a resource a card to a domain, you're not going to see it for a while, if ever. So, what oh, card can you uh, can you go without? Oh, for he's giving serious thought to resourcing could, Matthew Alexander. I can make my way through one and can't neutral. quite figure it out. With seeing the explorers out there, he's probably figured out that Dave is in fact running an explorer deck, given what was resourced, knowing that there's a fair chance that. Ultima Thule or Matthew Alexander is going to get popped into play on Dave's side, meaning that he'll be able to get in a free card himself. That is exactly the he thing that he was thinking about, whether or not he wanted to get rid of that card or keep it for a free pop. And he commits to it. So a resource of both Miskatonic and Yogg. But he He's opens with playing the alternative historian. That's correct. Drew his card. <laughs> Very similar. And Lucas Tutlow hits the table. I think you just took what I'm running and just added the splash to make it better. <laughs> that looks like it for uh, Jeremy's operation phase. He gets no story phase because of the first uh, turn. Two cards. Play passes to Dave. All right, and then I get, I, I get to resource. I don't have to resource. I have to remember how I brand them. Again, difficult Probably decisions no about what you resource first. That other neutral card that he has in his hand that he keeps pulling out is the prepared uh, alienist. It will prevent cards from being put full into of cards, play. And you're just ready to take me apart. All right, well, that's cool. So we got that going for us. Well, that could definitely slow Which down any nice. sort of uh, straight out of the hand shenanigans. That is a fact. All right, I'm going to pop. But it looks like he's choosing to resource it instead. Alien friends? No, that's not. That surprising since the prepared alien is also um, not sure what that one means. would also affect his Ultimate. own card, so he wouldn't be able to do yeah. his own uh, jumping yeah. shenanigans. One card in one oh. And then uh, I'm ready to go into stories. Hey, it's, it wasn't that good. I wanted to have like a med suit. Are using or something over here. Fool to uh, something pop a some explorers into play. And that, of course, allows Matthew Alexander to trigger himself to jump into play. Plus, you just said you're running so a bunch of black it. dogs, so I mean, Two I'm in one. trouble. Yeah. Uh, bad time to ask this, but invulnerability. Can't be wounded, can be destroyed. All right. I have willpower, I have all sorts of bullets and stuff. He's got guns. And counting and up the uh, counting up the icons, counting up the skill. R2's going choosing crazy. where to place his uh, initial success tokens. Because he outnumbers Jeremy, he can definitely win at least one uh, one uh, set of icon struggles. Place some uh, tokens down. And uh, because both players are playing uh, and just have Miskatonic characters in play, we see no uh, combat or terror icons as of yet. So basically, okay. that's not quite true. Oh, Matthew Alexander there. does, in fact, have oh, we do have one go go combat ahead. icon. So yeah. we'll give Jeremy a little bit of pause. It is one of the strengths of the explorers is that most of them have a, most of the unique explorers, I should say, have a single combat icon. Dangerous characters, those explorers. That's right. It's a tough, tough, scary world. Book, military, combat. That's the one in this game. Combat, books, 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 books skills, books. Maybe some books. Apparently, Dave is all about the books. On the other hand, uh, the books. Jeremy does have his alternative historian in play, oh, so if he, uh, no. chooses to, uh, if he chooses to uh, discard a card, you know, to cancel a struggle, he can. All right. Are we going to skip any stories? Oh my goodness, my wife has nachos. That looks so good right now. Sorry, focus on the game. Jeremy looking over his options. The question is, is he going to use Alternative Historian? Does he have any surprises? Because he does have an open domain.
So what is left to think about of these particular uh, stories here? And I think it's just a question about whether or not any uh, story struggles are going to get knocked out. Nothing, just start resolving. Start here. Jeremy has passed. Uh, combat we tie. Uh, book I win. Uh, inspection glass I win there. <laughs> That's all. Here. Uh, book, well, combat I win, book, inspection, win, and then for total four. I'm sorry, what? Yep. Almost had an opportunity though. to jump in. I almost cheated. <laughs> um, all right, and then that's all I got. Yeah, so it looks like uh, Dave all places three uh, success drop. tokens on one story and then one success token on another story. Pretty long lead on at least one of those stories. But again, they both have very similar characters in play. That could turn around pretty quickly. And play passes back to Jeremy. What is he going to uh, resource, if anything? Yeah, that rolled Ellsworth that was brought in with the ultimate fool, of course, is going to go back to his hand. Which, meaning, uh, if he goes back to his hand, he uh, can't be killed because he's not in play by any, uh, any of those sort of triggered effects. So That's a very, very safe place for him to be is uh, in Dave's hand right now. Although I did not see whether or not uh, Dave realized that he could trigger Rolled Eldworth's disruptability, which is when an explorer character you control would leave play, draw two cards, or put one card from your discard pile Shadows? into your hand. Oh, that's a disrupt, so guys. it would be able to do it even as Rolled was going back to hand itself. Mm. So it leaves play, guy. goes back to your hand, and optionally draw two cards. Or recover a card from your discard pile. Pretty strong. Uh, Very pretty, strong. Pretty high speed draw power in the uh, Miskatonic faction. And Joseph Meager has hit the board. We have our first Silver Twilight card on the board on Jeremy's side. Most unexpected. All right. And that, of course, is from the Denizens of the Underworld two cards. expansion. Resourcing, resourcing, resourcing. Some of these guys have got to be good at resourcing. It looks like Jeremy did not choose to uh, commit to a story on his turn. So he's just basically holding his, uh, his characters in reserve on, on uh, the defensive against Dave here. That's correct. That's Any correct. For me? Probably for lack of uh, more arcane icons on Jeremy's side. Uh, if you win an arcane struggle, if you have more uh, arcane icons on your side than your opponent, then you get to ready uh, an exhausted character. So it can be to your advantage to just go all in on, uh, on, our, on the arcane struggle and just stand your characters back up, you know, losing nothing. They come back into play on your, uh, for your opponent's turn on defense. But, uh, That's correct. Now, what we just saw was Dave using the ice shaft to kill off Joseph uh, Meir, which was an actually an excellent play, especially since he's just used Ultima Thule to put rolled back into play. This time, almost certainly, he's going to trigger that ability to bring back the ice shaft when rolled leaves play again at the end of his face. It's fantastic. That is... Uh Strong control card there. If he can keep putting the ice shaft back into play, it'll be very difficult for Jeremy to keep uh, low strength characters in play. Yeah. But that low skill is going to end up hurting him. And as a general rule, Miskatonic does not have a lot of high skill. So he's going to probably end up having to rely on the Yog Sothith and possibly Silver Twilight characters in hopes that he's got uh, some higher skill out there. Or find a way to get rid of Ultima Thule or get rid of um, World Ellsworth. Still though, both players are tied at zero stories one, so as of yet, it's still anybody's game, but clearly Dave is in the lead in terms of uh, characters on the board. Yeah, he's going to be able to win that, uh, that second story <laughs> that's out there right now. Yes. There's not going to be anything that uh, Jeremy is likely to be able to do to stop it with what's on the board. 
We'll see if those like two undrained domains are going to come into play and allow him to do some uh, mid-turn shenanigans. But we've been seeing that quite a bit, this sort of uh, rope-a-dope play where uh, you know, the uh, player falls back, lets his opponent win a little bit, and then suddenly out of nowhere, big reversal. I'm I mean, sorry, Mets, dude. That happened for Tom in the uh, game prior to the last match. But, or if you have uh, that two thing that really correct, messed correct. you in, up uh, In the last match, uh, Tom oh! Taper... Oh, Black Dog comes into play. Mm. So we'll, that will get rid of one of the characters. Of course, what Jeremy would have really liked to do is toss that Black Dog onto Story of the Heavy World Ellsworth so that he wasn't going to end up having to face that uh, bouncing ice shaft for, well, the rest of the game. But of course, having uh, double stacked protected uh, rolled very well. So that was a very good play on Dave's part. It is uh, something you have to keep very close track of in a game of uh, Call of Cthulhu. Is just where are the uh, where all the icons are, or what are in play. You know, just look at the board and uh, how many icons is your. Uh, does your opponent have that can that they can bring to bear in any given so struggle? It's hard to calculate because given that you can you can send your characters to any of three stories in play right from the start, and as conspiracies come into play, like you can really spread out your uh, your opponent's resources. We're all set. Start here. Uh, get my stand. Win the story. So the story he just won was will, Heart of the Labyrinth. Uh, I will trigger the story, and I will name character. So Dave triggered uh, the uh, yeah, you can name card of the labyrinth. Each well, player names a card type. The player to his left must then choose a card of that type he controls and return right. it to <laughs> hand. So Dave chose character, so that means that... Uh, All right. To, uh, yeah, that uh, Jeremy needs to return a character to hand. Yep, yeah, which he did. He has a single character oh, left at uh, the second dragon. Um... Uh, tight combat, no terror. Um, what's the other thing? Book, I win. Investigation, I win. Skill, I win. So another three-zero story on Dave's side. We look mainly for something to attempt to save her, and no. Nope. Uh, Jeremy does manage to uh, kill one character committed to a story. Pulls the back dog, black dog back oh, into his hand. Up. One thing. Yep, and just as I had said, Ice Shaft bounced back to hand. So we saw a Yogg Soth of card with an X value on that. That is almost certainly going to be a pushed into the beyond on Jeremy's side. And uh, what would Dave have to fear from uh, pushed to the beyond? Well, it has a wonderful effect so of being able to get something out of ones, the game. So, much. so it's, or I shouldn't say, it's not as if it removes it from the game. It's, it's one of the things that will take something that is in play and decidedly remove it. It's going to be quite a useful thing for Jeremy Hopefully he'll be able to get it in a fashion that will allow him to knock out that ice shaft rolled Ellsworth combo that is being um, used to such good effect. Yeah, it's a, it's a looming threat. And every turn, uh, uh, every turn, as long as uh, as long as Dave can put uh, Amundsen and Ice Shaft back into play, it's uh, to be very difficult for Jeremy to keep any sort of characters into play. Yeah. So he may end up to a domain of three resources so that he can shuffle Roald Ellsworth back into the deck, which will halt the uh, numerous shenanigans that are going on. Thanks, but holding back, you know, it, 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 it does put him into a very difficult position because Dave is already in the lead in terms of stories. And it can, does. It, can Jeremy it afford does. to hang back? Yes, sir.
course, the other option is to put out the Claret Knight, which is going to be immune to the Ice Shaft. However, that would be just one card that is immune. And and just not. one character, which, as I said before, like it can only commit to one story at a time. And uh, if Dave can come at him with uh, overwhelming force by just throwing tons and tons of characters at other stories that he is. Uh, he is going to go for the Claret Knight. Is that a Dreamlands card? Okay, good. <laughs> that was one heck of an icon lineup for that night. Sorry, Cthulhu listeners, we're not commenting that much because we're actually just uh, listening to Jeremy and Dave talk their way through their turn. So we're trying to catch what they're saying and hopefully offer some commentary there. They are. You're up, sir. Dave, at the very least, is a very talkative player, very conversational player. Jeremy, less so, but a bit of conversation uh, over this game. And Jeremy now choosing where to commit. His Claret Knight. Pretty strong character, immune to triggered effects, he said, so not a lot can happen to him, except perhaps just uh, uh, being killed in a combat struggle. However, that terror icon is going to do everything necessary to protect him with only happy. two characters standing. If they were to commit both of those characters, one would go insane, they'd push for combat. But again, losing a character to insanity is not something you generally want to lose, especially if it would put you behind you in characters, and let alone just losing one to being killed in a combat struggle. But, you know, in, insane can be almost as bad, at least in terms of slowing you down, slowing your tempo down, and losing your momentum. What Dave wants is to be able to just attack these stories as hard as possible, throw down tons and tons of success tokens, and what he needs for that is lots of, uh, lots of Miskatonic explorers ready to do that. There's plenty of resources in his hands should the opportunity arise. He's got the ice shaft for killing, he's got open for investigation to really nail down uh, the investigation struggles on a story, but... What we see here is Dave trying to figure out exactly what is the best way to handle the situation. With all three of his domains drained, he's looking at his cards for no particular purpose because there's nothing that he has he's going to be able to put into play. Ooh, and we see the push into the beyond. He's going to dump one of those explorers back into the deck, shuffled in. Matthew Alexander stays out on the table. That character will be going insane. So there we see the, uh, the balance tip a little bit with uh, Jeremy now outnumbering, uh, outnumbering Dave in terms of characters. And, and laying down three success tokens. That's correct. So now we see a little bit of a reversal there. Jeremy has more characters, has an equal number of success tokens on his side of the story, so things could start swinging back his way, although he is now completely uh, drained. All his domains are yeah, used no, up, so he won't have any surprises coming out of his hand go, on, uh, on Dave's turn. But he does still have more characters, and that's worth a lot. Icons and skill. And that also means that that uh, black dog will not be coming out this turn. These are the times you wish for uh, an Eldritch Nexus you know, to throw another uh, another domain out there for uh, for your new players. And uh, Eldritch Nexus is a card that uh, lets you create a new domain right off the top oh, of your is. deck, which means you you are sacrificing two cards to do it. But it gives you a Thanks little bit more options in terms of the number of <laughs> actions you can take that would drain domains over the course of your turn. But it looks like neither of them have needed it Not as much. Not that I have that guy in my hand. So what we saw, however, getting shuffled, um, as Dave seems to have a nervous tech, is an Ultima Thule, a Brett Wolfeson, and an Open for Inspection. Things might start to turn 
right back into his favor. It looked like Jeremy was getting a little uh, ahead on the tempo, but I think that that might be changing very shortly. Here goes Ultimo Fuel again. Oh, that is not a location. <laughs> he did forget. Lucas All Tutlow right, can steal non-locations, and Ultima Thule is not actually a location. It is a lost civilization. Wow. That feels like more of a misprinted card, though, because it's a lost civilization. So now it Jeremy is in controls. Fact not a misprinted card, <laughs> as I just said. So now lost Jeremy controls Ultima Thule, so again, we'll very much slow down Dave's, uh, Dave's Explorer play. Now, especially since he has a card that he owns that is out on the table that is unique. He will not be able to put another one into play until that card leaves play. Jeremy may have just time. put a serious crimp in the way that uh, Dave was planning on playing. A lot of his bouncing shenanigans are just not going to be able to come through anymore. And of course, he could just play the characters from his hand, just drain his domains, hard to, hard to put them into play, sure. but Ultima Thule is... So good, in that it like it puts them into play. They do their work, go back to the safety of the hand. No chance of being uh, killed or shuffled back into the deck otherwise. Yeah, especially with that ice shaft, though, he's going to want to be able to bounce Roald Ellsworth back and forth. And without Ultima Fool, that's going to be incredibly difficult to do. There's a very real chance that the next time that he uses the ice shaft, maybe his last time using the ice shaft. Well, Jeremy did have to give up a success token in order to steal Ultima Thule there, but uh, you never give one up without uh, the intention of stealing it right back. So we'll see what happens. Shuffling, reading his cards, and looking at his options. <laughs> Wide open domains. A lot of things can uh... happen here. Stories this turn. All right, Dave passes on his story phase, so play passes back to Jeremy. Dave just holding his characters in reserve for uh, for the defense, which he will most certainly need to do because uh, Jeremy is undoubtedly going to be putting more stuff into play this turn. A lot of the stuff in his hand low cost, so uh, certainly afford it's hard uh, hard play it in the play by draining his domains. Jeremy has uh, investigation icons of his own, arcane icons of his own, and certainly more combat icons than, uh, than Dave has. Another Lucas. Resources of Miskatonic cards. He has an all Miskatonic domain. He uses it to put another Miskatonic card in play. What is that one, Damon? The one uh, second from the left there. What did he just put into play? The second from the left? That would be Arcology Intern. So it would allow him to draw two cards and then choose one card from his hand and place it on the top of his deck. Definitely in the lead in terms of uh, in terms of characters and icons. So he certainly can win a story this turn. The question is, will he? So the card on the far left that is a little bit hard to see. That is Professor Morgan. That five cost. Character, three skill, one combat, one arcane, one investigation. It's an investigator faculty. It has willpower, which means it cannot be driven insane. And it has toughness plus one, meaning it will take two wounds to destroy it. And its response effect is okay. after you draw Professor Morgan from your deck in any phase other than the draw phase, put him into play. In this particular case, that was not something that I believe uh, got a chance to get triggered. I think that he had drawn that in his regular draw phase. Oh, no, no. Actually, that did come into play due to the Arcology Interns. Jeremy just 
just played Vortex of Time. Action is draw two cards. What? You can't trigger that instance, man. Interestingly enough, it also has a response effect, which is after a player drains a domain, reveal the top card of that player's deck. You place that card on the bottom of that deck. Limit once per turn. This effect can only be triggered from your discard pile. So what caught Dave by uh, surprise was the fact that Jeremy played the cards to draw two cards. Of course, he had to drain a domain to do so. Next comes the response window, and Jeremy triggered the response effect immediately of the Vortex of Time. Those Yogg, Sothoth, Yithian cards really make you pay very close attention to the discard pile. No, absolutely, absolutely. And because Dave is running just pure Miskatonic, I don't believe he has too many answers to cards that are in the discard pile. There are a couple of neutral cards, but I'm not sure if he's running them. Choosing which uh, which characters to commit to stories because he certainly could win a, uh, a story this turn. Spreading him out. So Jeremy is definitely winning on icons here. A number of struggles. So question here is. Uh, does Dave want to offer any sort of token to resistance to this, or is he going to let uh, Jeremy put down a bunch more uh, success tokens this turn? A lot of it's going to depend on what Dave we thinks that he's going to be able to do does. next turn. If he's got a good set of cards in his hand, he may decide to allow Jeremy to stack on some success tokens, knowing that he's going to be able to win the second dragon, possibly trigger it, get some cards into play and then potentially put enough success tokens and then, again, recover his cards, readying them from the Arcane Struggle of his own turn. Well, Jeremy certainly it's has Ar so Arcane icons available here, that, right? so yeah. less risk to him to just throwing all in. Absolutely, absolutely. So it'll be interesting to see what exactly Dave is going to do. Of course, the biggest issue is going to be that uh, Claret Knight sitting there with one of each icon. How many tactics do you run with Very little, like uh, very little you can do about that. Uh, very little Dave can do about that. About that. And uh, yeah. no terror icons. It's a lot. Pardon my no, uh, no willpower, it looks like. <laughs> All right, so let's go through so this. So if he commits anything to that story, somebody's logic. going to go insane. I do it here. You do that to this guy, the odds you get rid of him are like, uh, like 82%. Then this guy gets murdered. I Dave mathing out his odds here. He goes crazy, you do that, blah, 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 they all go away. I go there, get rid of this guy, and then this guy gets murdered. You're not leaving me many good options here. So I just have to say, you get a whole bunch of tokens. <laughs> Very tough choices to make here. Hard to know where to put characters down. Looks like Dave's going to let that go down unopposed, so... That is going to be three tokens on two yep. of the stories, and he's going to yep, win that, that one yep. outright. Does he trigger it? He does. He's going to bring back three oh, cards man, that he had dude. gone and resourced, and uh, he just lost a push and to be on. Your a other Nathaniel Teasley. Nathaniel Teasley. Still, it does seem like less of a loss to lose a Nathaniel Peasley when you are in the lead in characters and your opponent doesn't really have any characters you want to steal. So, probably, if it was going to happen, it's probably the best time for it. Well, I believe he actually pulled a Nathaniel Peasley off of that domain also. Mm. So, I believe he's got one in his hand and one again, once again, on that domain. So, the and option is to still say, there. Yeah. I have to say, even though the he might have characters on the board that he does not necessarily want being able to snag anybody 
with a combat or investigation icon from Dave's side may end up putting him in a position where he is not going to be able to put anything more than a token resistance up as Jeremy just slowly rolls to victory. The game is now tied though, one to one. So Jeremy in the lead in terms of characters and icons and he right now has more success tokens on his side of the board. So I think the choices are a little bit harder for Dave right now. Given the limited number of, uh, of actions you can take in a turn, you know, makes every decision really meaningful. I'm sure that's, Dave is just trying to work out what is going to work by uh, just playing right out of his hand. What's going to happen here? Goes up to a three resource uh, Miskatonic, do Miskatonic domain. So he can play up to two three cost cards from his hand. He has several, so what will he do? Will he put the ice shaft back into play, knowing that he can't just bounce it uh, with a uh, roll? No, don't do it! I have the what and the who? Jeremy's exploring his responses here. He does still have an open domain. Uh, I think Dave is just stuck with some analysis paralysis. He's been put into a position where he does not see an easy play, and I think his it's kind of a man at this comparative point. newness has got him in a position where I he's mean, it's not 100% sure of what Jeremy point. is going to do next. He doesn't really see a way out of the situation he's in right now. But he does have the ice shaft in play, which means that there is no low-skill character that is safe right now, unless well, Jeremy course, can... Except for the Claret Knight, which again is immune to triggered effects. Matt right now is the one that is creating such the problem for... Uh, it's true, Claret Knight has uh, you know, three out of the four icons. Just imagine how devastating it would be if it had all four icons. <laughs> Especially in this game. I'm just waiting for the black dog to make his appearance so he can fall down an ice shaft. I have a response, I guess. What does that mean? Awesome. Awesome. Oh, that's cheap. Come on. <laughs> I would. It's a pretty big deal. Very slow, very deliberative, deliberative play here. So many yeah, effects that okay. could go off. I'm not even gonna use it. I just wanted to make you squirm for a little bit on your way to the, the title. <laughs> yeah, Dave is definitely uh, trying his hardest to figure out what he can do in the situation. It say, I, I, I feel like it, it, uh, at this stage of the game, at this level of play, it could be overwhelming just the we number of things that could happen. Scores. I mean, I think that uh, Dave is potentially one. talking himself out yeah, of uh, doing a lot of things that he might do just because We're of knowing, you know, of the cards that uh, he's already seen in Jeremy's hand. Oh, definitely. Definitely. 
That's all I got. Sorry, dude. Uh, yeah. Looks like he's skipping the story phase. <laughs> no, no more again. I was just giggling a little. And the uh, vortex of time is <laughs> triggered once again person. at the uh, draining of that domain. Remember, it can happen once per turn. That's both Jeremy's turn and on Dave's turn. I was trying to let him go it's pretty mean, there, the fact that he keeps firing from the, uh, from the discard pile there every time a, uh, a player my, drains the domain. On tilt. So you can the card that he really would uh, need if he's going to be playing straight Miskatonic, uh, the way he's got right now, is even death may die. I will look at that and do this. And uh, what would that oh, yeah. do? What would that do to uh, to yeah, save uh, to save his bacon in this situation? Well, even death may die is a uh, card from the sleeper below. Of course, at this particular point, it'd be a little too late to have it. But it's an attachment that you uh, stick on an opponent's discard pile. And when a card would enter the attached discard pile, instead you remove it from the game, then you place one success token on it. It, of course, is a faded card, and it's at faded four, meaning you go off four times before it goes uh, away itself. Yeah, I guess uh, a card like that you would have wanted to see long before. Uh, definitely, before definitely. That card came at out. this particular point, because a lot of players knew that the uh, Yithian mill deck was not going to be a thing, I think. A number of players have decided to not opt to include anti-discard pile shenanigans from their deck. And I have to say, I think that may have been a mistake. Well, especially against Jeremy's deck here. I mean, even though it is not well, primarily is focused on the Ethian Mill, primarily focused on those sort of discard pile effects, even just that one effect that Dave is not nice. playing against is very, very difficult to... Uh, do anything to certainly, certainly, and actually, even uh, Jeremy could have used it earlier in the game himself with oh that okay. bouncing uh, ice shaft. You've been able to take that out of play and kept that uh, out of the game and kept himself a character or two. You pretty much got this, right? Let's see Try here. Chapman. This could be the end of the game here. Uh, Jeremy is way ahead in characters and icons, and he's got more success tokens on his side of the board, and Dave has very little to respond to it. Only two characters and an ice shaft. He does have three open domains. There could be some shenanigans in his hand, but I don't know. Can it hold back the assault here? I Dave's mean, actually only got one open domain. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I didn't yeah. see those teeny tiny little cathedrals there. <laughs> Kind of obscured. Yes, yes, they fade so well into that murky, swampy background. Yeah, so in that yeah. case, yeah, only. This is going to be it. This is going to be game. There's not going to be anything that Dave is going to be able to do to stop um, Jeremy from winning those two stories. It can certainly win in skill. It can certainly win on, uh, on investigation. And even with removing a character with Ice Shaft, it's still not enough to prevent. Uh, the skill struggle, uh, Jeremy from winning the skill struggle. Um, actually, if he doubles up in oh, yeah. one okay. of them, gets rid of a three, he'll be able to push, I believe. So I think he'll end up with only a single combat icon and push from beyond. That's it. That That's game. Well. And then it's still, you're going to make him go and Playing it out, but uh, yep. 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 Nope, there we that's go. it. There we go. So well once done, again, Jeremy's, Jeremy's word repeating. Still My own fault. very good like show from, uh, location, from right? relative newcomer Dave Bergstrom there. Yeah, yeah. So. yeah. making it to the first, uh, <laughs> to that like final it's, table, it's and I believe on his first appearance at Worlds <laughs> in uh, Call of Cthulhu is... Very, very impressive. Yeah, impressive. but uh, Jeremy showing his skill as a, uh, as a deck other, builder and a good. hard player. You make a mistake and you learn from it. Yeah, I have to say that Jeremy played very well. I don't think I saw any particular play mistakes yeah, anywhere on there, and that's always a really, uh, really complicated thing to play against as somebody who just 
doesn't make mistakes. Yeah, as they say, uh, as they say, uh, you know, the the winner is the one who made the second to the last mistake. But uh, <laughs> didn't look like there were any on Jeremy's side. Just uh, yeah, he paid built. very close attention to all the cards in play. Very close attention to his deck. Just waited for it to do what it does. Did not rush himself. Yeah, he built a really good deck, and it looks like um, even running three factions that. It just runs really well. Very streamlined, very consistent. And he only had one copy of that Claret Knight in his deck, but it was doing a lot of work, so very good to see it early on. It is, in fact, a workhorse. I am a big fan of that, and I try and include it in most of my decks. And easily, uh, easily done, as it is a neutral card. Definitely, definitely. I'm running, I'm running to the park. So I think we're getting a chance to see uh, in a few minutes Jeremy's Worm. Um, meet up with our uh, vice president in charge of uh, marketing, right? Marketing, Steve marketing Forza. communications, my boss. Yep, we'll be presenting Jeremy with his prizes, do a little handshaking, a little clapping on the back. It'll be uh, And applause all around for, right. for a stunning play. Wow. Yeah. I was actually really impressed, really impressed with uh, Jeremy's deck. As I said, you know, my uh, favorite split of factions right now happens to be uh, Miskatonic. I mean, sorry, happens to be Silver Twilight and Yogg-Sothoth, and adding that Miskatonic really, really paid off for Jeremy. So Definitely, kudos yeah. for his uh, insight into that. He had the response icons there, and was not able to, or he managed to keep Dave from just totally steamrolling him in terms of the uh, investigation struggles. So yeah, that was really important. I think that if he had just played straight ahead uh, without Miskatonic, that he may have ended up losing just as he his deck started to really uh, fire off in all cylinders. That investigation allowed him to first slow and then overwhelm Dave. So, well, well done, Jeremy. Well done. Well done, and well done, Dave too. Oh, Dave's play was really good. I think I think it was that one mistake of losing the um, the ultimate fool. ultimate fool that uh, really put him on his back foot, and I don't think he was ever to recover after that. And that can affect your whole game. You know, you make a mistake, and then suddenly, just thinking about it, it's like, what sure. more mistakes can I can I be making, rather than just sort of thinking ahead about like what you know, what can I do to just kind of move past it. Yeah, definitely rock your uh, confidence a bit. And recovering from that is really difficult. Really difficult. Something that uh, you know the top players, of course, need to, uh, or act, in order to be a top player, you really need to be able to develop. You're gonna make a mistake at some point, final table, and. You know, losing, you know, that one card at just that wrong time can really uh, change the entire complexion of the game. But it should be said that both Dave and Jeremy are very good card players across many games. So, definitely, and definitely. if anything, Some of our best. if anything, Dave is is mostly just a, a, a newcomer, a relative newcomer to Call of Cthulhu versus Jeremy, who uh, won the championship last year. So mm -hmm. it's a tough fight for anybody, and it's a very well played for Dave being able to get to the final table under those circumstances, beating uh, a former world champion, a former multiple world champion, Tom Caper, on the way there. Yeah, yeah. That is definitely a feather in his cap. As was said before, Tom has the most wins of any single individual across all of our games. It's true. It's an impressive, impressive turnout for uh, Tom. He's got more championship cards than any other player. So if we see Dave at uh, Call of Cthulhu again next year, then I think he will, I think he will give all of the, uh, of the players that will run for their money. Yeah, definitely. I think that he may have been a bit of a dark horse. I think a lot of players on his way up to here probably underestimated him, again, being a newer face. Um, but next year, I don't think so. I think yeah. each player is going to recognize that Dave is a force to be reckoned with. Absolutely. You know, and the, the Call of Cthulhu community is small and closely knit, and uh, you hear about what the top tier players are doing. You know? Oh, definitely. Uh, both of their decks uh, and Tom's are going to be uh, talked about for quite a bit. I know that when the Seekers of Knowledge uh, Deluxe box first came out, there was a fair amount of buzz about Explorers, but generally speaking, because they're loyal, because so many of them are three cost, um, they didn't get explored nearly as much. I think a lot of people were still really focused on the fact that you had to you know, have an incredibly fast deck and you know, win in two, maybe three turns. And while they definitely are a rush deck, it's a little bit of a delay. You just slowly roll for a couple of turns and then just add the pressure. But I think we're getting ready to move on to uh, Steve Horvath presenting uh, Jeremy with his prize. Let's see if they're ready for that. All right. Sorry. 
All right. I'm here with Jeremy Zorn, defending world champion for Call of Cthulhu, t taking it for the second time. And how many world championships is this for you now? Four, is that right? So two Cthulhu, one Android Netrunner, and one Warhammer Invasion. What's next? I see you here every year, every final. What, what game is next? What are you playing tomorrow? Conquest. Conquest, okay. Well, conquering conquest, I guess. Well, we'll try. is it going for five? We'll try. Well, Eric, do you have any questions? It, he, you saw him just tear up your game today. So, were you expecting Miskatonic Rush as your final matchup? I was not. Um, I was expecting Tom to be facing me in the final there. So, but Dave is also a very, very good player, so it's not that big of a surprise. But he has a very quick deck. As you saw, he almost beat me right away there. He made one crucial mistake. And after that, I was able to capitalize on it and just spin the whole game around. And instead of him rushing me, I started rushing him. And Miskatonic is one of your worst matchups, isn't it? It can be. If he gets draws like that really fast, cheap guys for free right away, there's not much I can do. So I was worried. So what do you think was the crucial turning point in the match? When he played his ultimate Thule the second time, right. I had Lucas Tello out there, so I was able to disrupt it and gain control of it. And that just changed the whole game right there. That was really exciting to watch. I'm glad. All right. All right, we have some cool stuff for you here now. Thank you. Congratulations, man. It's a pleasure to watch. It really is. Thank you. <laughs>